the death of Jesus is the death of the Adamic race. That's how, that's how Jesus being the last Adam is incredibly good news. We're going to talk about Jesus being the last Adam. Watch the good news about Jesus being the last Adam. So are you ready? Can we take a good look at the Word of God? I believe there's so much good news that we can find in scriptures. And the more we see how good the good news is, our worries and anxieties disappear. We are filled with assurance. We are filled with hope. Uh, we are filled with joy. And uh, we can face whatever challenge ahead. And we also become messengers of God because the good news is what we need to share. Now, can I take you this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Amazing chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's read verse 45. Okay? You can uh, see... The verse is there in your screen. Let's go to verse 45. There it is. So it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul, living being, and the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So here Paul wrote this, and he actually, this phrase became Adam became a living being. Some translations say living soul. That's actually from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. So the first man, Adam, became a living being. And it says here, the last Adam. I want to highlight this title of Jesus being the last Adam. Because there's so much good news there. Oh man, I... I'm excited. There's so much good news in seeing Jesus. Jesus being the last Adam. And you see here, just as the first man, Adam, he was a clump of mud, dust mixed with water. And then the breath of God was upon him. And what happened? He became a living soul. He became a living being. Even so, the last Adam, he became a life-giving spirit also by the breath of God, also by the Spirit of God. Now, very important that we distinguish Jesus being the last Adam. And also, if you read verse 47, look at verse 47. The first man was of the dust of the earth, and the second man is of heaven. See, the first man, that's Adam, and the second man, you know, the word Adam in Hebrew is actually translated man, or the second Adam is of heaven. So very important that we distinguish between Jesus being the last Adam and Jesus being the second Adam. There's a big difference between the two. Now, why... Are we talking about Adam? What is so important about that? You see, the world is what it is today. The world with all the pandemic, with all the viruses, with all the disease, with all the economic crisis. The world is what it is today with all the greed, corruption, violence, with all the suffering, with all the injustice. With all this evil wars going on, it is what it is today because of one man, Adam. Adam, because of one man's deed, death came to all the world. Because of one man's deed, sin entered the world. Condemnation entered the world. Because of one man's deed, Adam. You see, you can actually, uh, let me bring you, okay, first, 
we're in 1 Corinthians. If you go back to verse 21, you can actually read that. That's verse 21. Say here. It says here, For since death came through a man, okay, death in the world, all of humanity became subject to death. How? Through one man, Adam. The resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. So in the same way that through one man, death came to all of humanity, also in the same manner, resurrection from the dead comes through one man. And who is this one man? Jesus Christ. There's a contrast between Adam and Jesus Christ. Then uh, verse 22, read with me verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So death came through one man, Adam, but through Christ, the second Adam, all will be made alive. Now let's go this morning to Romans chapter 5. I want to show you Romans chapter 5. Okay. There we have Romans chapter 5. Go with me to verse 17. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Wow. Through this one man, Adam, death reigned. How did death come to rule over all of humanity? Through Adam, through one man. But also, even as so much destruction and damage came through one man, it says that here, how much more? How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So bad news came through Adam, but the good news came through Jesus Christ. Then you continue reading verse 18. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. One trespass. One misdeed, one disobedient work, one work of disobedience resulted in condemnation for how many? All people. All people. All nations. In all of history, all human beings were condemned. How? Why? Through the trespass of one man. Then it says here, but so also, on the other hand, one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. So here, bad news came through Adam, but the good news came through Jesus Christ. And verse 19, let's continue reading. Verse 19, For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also, through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Through the disobedience of Adam at the garden, to maybe thousands of years ago, the many were made sinners. So also, on the other hand, through the obedience of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, the many will be made righteous. That's Romans chapter 5 verse 19. Now, how many, okay, here's the question, how many 
sinful deeds did you do so that you became a sinner? How many disobedient works did you do so that you became a sinner? Zero. You did not do anything to become a sinner. You became a sinner not because of what you did, but because of Adam. Because of what Adam did. You became a sinner because of one man's misdeed. But on the other hand also, you have become righteous. How many righteous works did you do so that you became righteous? How many good works did you do so that you became righteous? Zero. Okay, the world will tell you. Religion will tell you. You become righteous by what you do. If you do righteous things, then perhaps maybe after a while, you will become righteous. Probably. That's religion. But the gospel declares you became righteous not by what you did, but because of what Jesus Christ did at the cross. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that good news? Now let me address this question. Why are we, you know, why did we fall because of Adam? Why is it that the world is what it is today because of Adam. You know, Adam, he lived thousands of years ago. We were not born yet. Why were we part of his misdeed? Why did we become sinners because of what he did? I mean, isn't that unfair? You see, here's a, a, a very important biblical concept that we need to understand. What happened to your ancestor happened to you. Because even though that time you were not yet born, you were in the body of your ancestor. You were in the body of your ancestor. See, that concept we can see in Hebrews chapter 7. Let me show you very quickly Hebrews chapter 7. Here in Hebrews chapter 7, this is talking about, you know, the author of Hebrews, probably it was Paul. He was actually explaining how the Melchizedek priesthood is superior to the Levitical priesthood. And that Levi is actually inferior to Melchizedek. He was explaining that. And how did he, how did he explain that? He said that the one who released the blessing, the blesser, is greater than the one receiving the blessing. And he said, Levi is lesser than Melchizedek. Why? Because Levi was the one receiving the blessing. And there's a big problem. Because Levi existed around 400 years after Melchizedek. Four centuries. When Melchizedek lived, Levi was not yet born. But the, the author of Hebrews explained, Levi was in the body of his ancestor who was Abraham. 400 years before Levi was born, Abraham submitted to Melchizedek and Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And Levi was in the body of his ancestor. Levi was going to be born 400 years after but the, the, the concept is he was in the body of his ancestor. L let me show you, okay? Hebrews chapter 7, verse 9. Look at verse 9. It says here, One might even say that Levi, who collected the tenth, paid the tenth to Abraham, through Abraham. Verse 10. Here's that verse. Because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. You see that phrase, in the body of his ancestor. So 400 years before Levi, here's Abraham submitting to Melchizedek. And the author said, well, that means Melchizedek is more superior to Levi because Levi was in the body of his ancestor. Now, very, very important aspect. Let me give you an illustration. 
My grandfather, during World War II, 80 plus years ago, I wasn't born, of course, I wasn't born yet. I'm, how old am I? <laughs> but way back in World War II, 1942, my grandfather fought the war here in Davao City all the way to northern Mindanao. They pursued the retreating Japanese forces. Now, what if my grandfather died in 1942? What if a bullet shot through his head and he died? Well, that means I would have died also. I wouldn't be here talking to you now. I would not have existed because what happened to him happened to me. But he lived. And so, therefore, I'm here right now. So that's, that's the key. Now, back when there was no human being yet on planet Earth, when only Adam and Eve existed, none of us were born yet. There were no Chinese. There were no Nigerians. There were no Brazilians, Portuguese. There were no Americans. There were no Russians. No human being was on planet Earth yet. Only Adam and his wife Eve. Where were we? We were not yet born, yes, but where were we? We were in the body of our ancestor. So that fateful day when Adam committed high treason against God, that fateful day when Adam rebelled against God, turned his back on God, and submitted to Satan, Satan as his new king, that fateful day, what happened to Adam? He fell from God. His connection with God was cut off, and he became a slave of Satan. But what happened to you and me? What happened to an entire human race? What happened to Adam happened to you and me, happened to all of us. When Adam fell, we all fell. When Adam became a slave of the enemy, we became slaves of the enemy. When Adam's nature was corrupted, we all have become corrupted. All of humanity, all human beings on planet Earth in all of history was corrupted because of one man's misdeed. You see, we were born sinners. We, we didn't become sinners because of what we did. We were born this way. We were born spiritually dead. We were born with a corrupt nature because of what one man did. But the good news is Jesus became the last Adam. When Jesus when Jesus, when he, the word became flesh, he became one of us. But even more, even more, brothers and sisters, even more, he became, he became the sum totality of all of us. He, he became sin on the cross. He became sin. He who knew no sin, he became sin. All of our corruption, all of our slavery, all of our perversion, all of our misdeeds. He owned it all. So that he became part of Adam. Not only part of Adam, but he became Adam. So that when he died at the cross, he killed, he terminated the fallen race of Adam. The death of Jesus is the death of the Adamic race. That's how, that's how Jesus being the last Adam is incredibly good news. Jesus being the last Adam, you know the word last, it means ending. It means end. You know, like the movie, The Last of the Mohicans. You know, it's taken from a book. It's the book's title, a novel, The Last of the Mohicans. Mohicans, that's a, it, an Indian, North American Indian tribe. And, you know, almost all of the Mohicans were killed, wiped out, but there were only a few last remaining 
and the death of those people was the death of the Mohican tribe. The death of Jesus was the death of the fallen Adamic race. The death of Jesus was the death of the old creation. The death of Jesus was the end of the fallen, corrupted human race. But Jesus being the second Adam, he being the second man, he is the beginning of the new creation. He is the beginning of a new race, of a new humanity. So, can I show you some more scriptures here? Can I take you to 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me take you to verse 14. Paul writing again. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. Who is this one who died for all? Jesus said the love of God, the love of Christ compels us to speak the good news to every human being, every race. We tell the good news. Even those people who don't want to hear the good news, even those people who are so religious, they hate, you know, they don't like being told about Jesus. We tell the good news to everybody. Whether they're listening or not, we are so compelled by the love of God to tell the good news to our neighbors, to people in other cities. We want to go and speak to everybody the good news. The love of Christ compels us. Why? Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. This is, you know, good news is something that happened already. That's news. News is actually an announcement of something that happened already. So Paul is saying, I'm convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. That when Jesus died at the cross, the old humanity died. One died for all, and therefore all died. So now, let me tell you, let me ask you, what are you now? You are now a new creation. Uh, let's continue reading verse 15. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Once you receive that news, you now realize that the old you is dead, that you are now a new creation. You're not a sinner trying your, your very best to be good. You're not a sinner trying to be righteous. You're not a sinner doing all that you can to be righteous, trying to stop sinning because I'm a sinner, but I must not sin. That's not you anymore. You're not a sinner anymore. You are perfectly righteous in the eyes of your father. The old sinful you died already, dead already. And you should no longer live for yourself, but for him who raised you, who was raised from the dead. Then verse 16 says here, From now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. We no longer look at people from a worldly point of view. Though, once upon a time, Paul said, we, we view Jesus in such a way. You know, Paul before, he was a persecutor. He hated Christians. He actually killed a lot of Christians. He, he actually hated Jesus. So he said, I, 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 I viewed people from a worldly point of view before, but now we, we no longer see people from a worldly point of view. What is a worldly point of view? You view people according to, you know, oh, this guy is good, oh, that guy is bad, according to, you know, how much money they have or probably how they look or 
probably what they're wearing or what they're driving. So th those are all worldly point of views. But we no longer view people that way. We view people the way God looks at them, as new creation. And then verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, and the old has gone, the new is here. The new creation has come. You are now a new creation. The old has gone. The old has passed away. And let's jump to the last verse. Verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He who knew no sin. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So isn't that amazing? Take a look at this. When Jesus died, sin died. When Jesus died, the old creation, corrupted creation died. That's why Jesus being the last Adam is good news. Because by the death of Jesus, that was the death of the fallen Adamic race. It is finished already. Now, you may think, okay, so if that's the case, then we have nothing more to do. Well, it is finished. Oh, that's the basis now of our mission. That's why if you look at um, if you look at Matthew, this is the the Great Commission, Matthew chapter twenty eight. It says in Matthew chapter twenty eight, verse sixteen. It says here this is this is where, where when Jesus was about to be, you know. Uh, ascended, caught up into heaven. Then the 11 uh, disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them. There, there were 11 of them because Judas, uh, he, he committed suicide, so there's only 11. And then verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then verse 18, it says here, Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. See, this is after the resurrection. Jesus was declaring his victory. Satan no longer has authority. Satan no longer is king. The authority that used to be upon Adam, what was transferred to Satan, now Jesus has taken, taken it back. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Then verse 19, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see here, after Jesus announced the victory, he said, Therefore, go. Therefore, go. You see, this, this is the more we realize what has been accomplished at the cross, the more our hearts burn for everybody to know this. For everybody to know. And what is our message? Our message is about what has been accomplished. This is news, good news that we're telling people. Righteousness is not by what you do. Righteousness is simply by being in Christ. Because the root of our problem is our being in Adam. And there's no way out of Adam, not our good works, not our good deeds. Because we were born in the lineage of Adam. The only way out is death. But that's exactly what happened. He killed the Adamic you. 
And you are born into a new family. You are born again. Now, a person in Christ. No longer in Adam, but in Christ. You're not a sinner trying your best to be good, to be holy. Actually, you are a holy person living according to who you really are. Religion is actually all about behavior modification. It's like teaching a dog how to walk upright. That's not the nature of dogs. Dogs have four feet. <laughs> That's their nature. They walk on all fours. No matter how you teach a dog, the dog, no matter how it will try to walk upright, it will always return to its nature. In Adam, we had a very corrupt nature. But in Christ, you have a perfectly beautiful, holy nature. That's who you are. You're not a sinner trying to behave good. You are a righteous, holy person living according to who you really are. So we need, we need the good news all the time. As Christians, I have been a Christian for a long time. I need to hear the good news again and again. I need to hear the news of who I really am. That I am taken care of by my Father. That I am a beloved child of my Abba. That I am my Abba Father's favorite. That my Father cares for me. That I never leave my Father's sight. I need to be reminded again and again of who I am. And then also, secondly, I need to realize that the good news is for everybody. For everybody. Every human being on planet Earth. Every, every one of my friends. Everyone, all people outside this gate, they all need the good news. And guess what? You, my brother, my sister, you are called by God to be a sharer of the good news. To be a messenger of the good news. Because the good news is the power of God unto the salvation of everyone who believes. See, the, the key there is believing. Because no matter how good God has done in Christ, all the good that God has done, if a person does not believe, he cannot access. You can only access what God has done through your believing. So this is very important, brothers and sisters. And you and I are vessels through which God will speak to so many who need to hear the good news.